Welcome to this, um, this lecture series, Technology Empowered Conservation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Jepson and I direct the MSc in Biodiversity, Conservation and Management. What was that? <laughs> There's a few of them here, anyhow, um, in it. So I'm going to give you a sort of 15 to 20 minutes introduction to the series as a whole. And then our main speaker is Alex Rogers, who will we'll come on to after I've uh, finished up. But just to sort of scope the, uh, the idea um, of the, the seminar series. I was going to start by saying many of you will remember that we had a really great conference on Biodiversity Technology Symposium back in 2012. But looking around, Peter, are you the only one who went to it here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, in 2012, we had... We had a, had a, when we had a, well, it's all good, but when the Biodiversity Institute was really going, we had a really nice symposium in September on biodiversity technology. And there's this wonderful vibe to it of all these people, different people coming together, thinking about how technologies might bring about a change uh, in science and how we were working and innovating with them. And there's a real sense that actually something was happening. And perhaps inspired, or not perhaps inspired by this or realising this, we introduced a biodiversity technologies module into our MSc in biodiversity conservation and management. And this has been running about three or four years now. Many of the speakers in this uh, seminar series have also te taught on that. But this year is the 15th anniversary of BCM. So we thought it might be fitting to come together as uh, an Oxford community to sort of take stock on where we are five years on from that, uh, that first uh, um, symposium. Uh, that first symposium we had. So if you're just thinking about, you know, what are we talking about here? For me, a lot about what this seminar series is, is fundamentally about is about data and the idea that we're uh, experiencing a step change in data. Data, of course, is, you know, it's the lifeblood of what we do as scientists. It's what's, you know, what's our rationale. It's what we learned and um, evidence and so forth things with and there's a big change has been going on I mean maybe this has always been happening but it seems to be accelerating and changes in how we capture and generate data how we manage and organize it how we analyze and visualize it and how we apply it and also there's changes in you know in actually when are thinking about what is data or deciding what sort of data matters or what data is out there and there's a lot of you know as you know with the open access thing talk about actually who gets access to data and how access is uh, granted um, uh, to data. So a lot of what we're going to think about, I hope, in this seminar series are these, these ideas about data and the dis different forms of data we're using in different ways and how those data come about and how they're applied. Now, when I was a lad, not so long ago, actually that was a long ago, but not so long ago, the practice of science, at least to me, seemed relatively straightforward. You went out there and you collected data. Uh, you collected it, in my case, using my ears and eyes. Those were the sensors in it. Created it into my personalized, curated data sets. And with that, did a bit of stats. And with that, in my area, I was uh, using that to um, evidence uh, questions. Particularly, you know, what sort of quota should we take of harvesting parrots or whatever. That was the data practice. And I was aware that my colleagues in uh, universities in those days, they were a little bit more sophisticated. They were collecting better data sets. Some of them may have had the money to uh, you know, uh, use bigger sensors on ships and, and, and so forth. Maybe using more sophisticated st statistics, a little bit of modeling, and working a bit more to questions about theory as well as providing evidence for scientific evidence. But generally, the sort of practice of doing science seemed pretty straightforward or you know it was yeah we know what we're doing uh, sort of thing then about about maybe about 20 years ago we had there may be more but there's in my mind there was two big step changes which came through the first was biodiversity informatics or informatics more generally biodiversity informatics in our field where there was this effort which is still going on to link up all of the disparate data sets, data corpora, data sets which were out there, particularly the, the big data sets in museums, in um, research institutes, and create data interoperability. So we can move from those small personal data sets to bigger um, you know, networked uh, data sets. 
And this is where we saw the bringing in of uh, data standards, thinking about uh, data access, data portals, and platforms where there's some very sort of early decision support tools could, could go on. And that sort of brought about a step change in, in terms of the, the volume of data, the sort of questions we can ask. Many of you may have heard of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Quite a lot of, you know, a big global uh, network of networks of, of data. So that was one big step change. Perhaps the, the biggest step change was the rise of remote sensing and GIS. Well, this was a, a bit of a game changer, maybe, as it was coming in. And it's still um, having big impacts. You know, we get the satellites up there and the sensors, these new sensors on the satellites, really expanding the range of data we had, in this case, to think about the Earth. But through that, geographic information systems coming in, spatial analysis coming in in a big way, the practices of designing and uh, organizing workflows coming in to bring all of these data sets together, the emergence of decision support tools coming in, and now, I mean, it's, I find this quite amazing, some of the really sophisticated analysis, which five years ago you needed to be quite highly trained to do, you can do it on a click now. So we're getting this sort of software as a utility coming in. So really quite big changes uh, going on. So, you know, going from that simple model of science practice where I started out, we now have new sensors, we now have new tools, GPS, many of them. We have the rise of commercial data sets in, in our science. We have the beginning of what we call streamed data, um, data which is constantly coming down from the satellites. I know it's sort of um, punctuated uh, at the moment, getting faster and faster. We have the spatial analysis coming in and decision tools coming in. And this is sort of where, maybe where we've been for, for a while now. But over the last perhaps five or so years, things have really been changing in my view. First of all, the number of sensors and the range of things you can put sensors on is going from, I don't know, what we had before to just about anything. You know, we put sensors on bees now uh, if we want. We've got acoustic sensors. We've got, you know, with all of the, what's come with smartphones, gyrometers, all of these different sensors which are now available to us and which we're using. We've got open data, which is coming in. Uh, so, you know, there's much more access to data. And then we've got these big new data corpora, uh, the internet and social media data, and this notion of exhaust data. This is the area I work at, and we'll be looking at this in uh, week five uh, in, uh, <coughs> in Culturomics. We've got screen data, which has been there, but is now affordable. You know, the DNA genomic data, where you're putting it into machines to screen it. And we'll be hearing about that from uh, Gregor Larson in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in eighth week. We've got machine learning coming in, artificial intelligence, incredible, you know, powerful analytical abilities which are now here. And we'll be hearing about this next week when we um, hear about uh, the plastic tide from Peter Kohler and Dirk Goronson. We'll be hearing about some really, I was going to say high end, cutting edge um, image recognition using uh, AI. And then we've got crowd um, analysis out there. We're not going to talk about that too much because previously in Oxford we've talked a lot about Zooniverse, which is the, a really great example of, of cloud curating and analysing data. And of course, the crowd in citizen science is down there in terms of data generation as well. And maybe in the future, we're moving to applications which are going beyond decision support tools, which is where it is now, into this future where we have research and conservation management droids coming out of all of this, and where will that take us? And then, in this really complex system we're now working in, in terms of our scientific practice, there's other big forces going on. One of them is, when it comes to sensors and mounts, is that, well, sensors particularly, the miniaturization, the affordability of them, the acquirability of them, and the buildability of them. You know, previously you wanted one of these sensors, you used to have to get quite a decent research grant maybe from them and then find it. Now, as we'll hear from Alex Rogers in week three, not this Alex Rogers, Alex Rogers from Computer Science, um, but, you know, you now download the, uh, the prints for them and you can get them made locally. Really empowering for people, scientists, you know, not in, uh, in developed countries. But I think also Alex will tell us that in some ways some of the analysis is moving from the top, if you like, and coming down into 
sensors and sensor networks as well. Added to that, we've got the four Vs of big data. Big data, my goodness, it's speeded up since when I started out. We've got the volume of it, which I was talking about, both in informatics and, and now all of this stream data. My goodness, you know, how much is coming in. The velocity with which data is, is available to us and the veracity. Veracity meaning the variety of it and actually the messiness of quite a lot of it as well. So I hope you get a sense that I think we're in moving in to a different, perhaps a different era of, uh, of our science with these things. So this seminar series, this next eight weeks, the idea is that each, each week we'll hear from a researcher about the, the different science repertoires they're putting together. So if you imagine that, how it used to be, you say, yeah, this is the way we did it. And now you've got all of that out there. So this, this idea of science repertoires, that as scientists, we're having to think, you know, how are we putting all of this together to sort of orchestrate the scientific outcomes which we're looking to find? You know, how do we do that so we can create the answers or the tools to those things which, which matter to us? And that's really the idea of this uh, seminar series. As we're doing this, I mean, every week we're going to be listening to some pretty cool science and some pretty cool questions and some, hopefully, it'll be inspiring. Well, not hopefully, it will be inspiring. But I think also that there's um, some broader questions we might like to ask and think about. One of the ones which you may have heard of is that these, these big claims of the big data uh, people, the claims of sort of the end of science um, and so forth, that, you know, big data... Or, Big data is just going to change it all, you know. It's pushing us to, you know, stop looking closely at things and sort of look at things from all sorts of different directions. They're arguing that it's the end of the theory, or that we'll build trust, we'll find trust in correlations. As you know, most of it, we've never quite trusted correlations, not quite sure what they are. We want causality. Arguing that, also arguing that we're going to move into a, a fourth paradigm of science, a fourth data, oh, sorry, pattern-driven paradigm of science, that we're moving into something quite different. What are we going to think about that? Is that the case? Well, some commentators say, no, not really. This end, there is no end of theory. There's only new opportunities. Sandrina Leonelli, who writes some really nice stuff on this, she's down at Exeter, you know, saying that you can't, you know, science is a, is a culture, it's a way of doing things. It's based on histories of thought, of practices of doing it. The only way we know what is original or different or unusual is when we have a structure to science. It isn't going to be this open, sort of free-for-all science. But also they're starting to raise some interesting questions which we need to be, I think, cognizant of, of science. Is that with this new data sort of technological assembly, the notion of bias is changing. The notion of scientific bias is changing. Whereas previously we could account for bias because we were designing the data and uh, the scientific practices now a lot of bias in data is part of institutional politics, you know? Do we get time to put our, make our data freely available? It may be a bias actually within the technology, the APIs with which we can work with or so forth. So there's different forms of bias coming into science which may be a little bit more uh, difficult to deal with. Another thing we might like to think about is, are we planning for technology transition in a coordinated and strategic way um, in our universities. You know? There's also these questions which I think we've talked about them for quite a long time. Peter, we've talked about this quite a lot. What should be a science output in the future? Now, the main science output is an academic paper. But what happens if you create that cool data infrastructure which just makes loads of things happen? Or you create that great decision support tool left, I'm thinking of, up there. Should these have equal value and equal esteem in the academy as a scientific paper? Or does the scientific paper just become the manual and the advertisement and the justification of something different and something uh, more applied? An ongoing one, which I don't know whether it's ever going to be resolved, is who finances the new data infrastructures which all of this takes? I'm not sure, you know, individual universities are getting their heads around this. I'm not sure we have an overall plan for it. The one which is starting to keep me awake a little bit um, in my role as a course director is are we training young scientists with the skills and aptitudes <coughs> needed for this quite rapid transition going on? So is our academic culture actually fit for purpose uh, to, do, to 
um, to work in this new world? So I think there's some big questions we can ask there. We can also ask what do we want to do with all of this new technological scientific powers we've got. Back in the, um, back in the so five years ago when we had the Biodiversity uh, Technologies Symposium, Cathy Willis and myself, we put out the question of actually with all of this, should we be putting out big, hard to achieve visions, you know, just like uh, the space people do, let's land on Mars and try to achieve them, put out these game changing, potentially game changing visions which we can work towards. Cathy Willis's idea was the idea of a Shazam for biodiversity. An absolute game changer if rather than being limited to, you know, it's very difficult to, for instance, identify birds, you can just get your mobile phone out, oh yeah, Robin, amazing. What would that do? Could be transformative. My idea was something called uh, opti hunting, which was saying um, we have this big tension in conservation between hunters and non hunters, but actually we're all into nature uh, in different ways. Why don't we replace 1850 technology of a shotgun with an opti gun? and transform or bring about the sort of potential to transform hunting from a lethal sport which kills animals into a sort of real-time gaming pastime which is non-lethal uh, and produces data. Okay? So should we be actually thinking of that, just putting out massive ideas which we work, uh, work towards? <coughs> Another question uh, for us here, I'm very aware that the lineup on our uh, poster, it's all men. Okay. Is this area being led by men? Is this transition being led to men by men, or is it just an Oxford and my maybe sample bias in there? I think you need to be thinking about this, about the leadership here. Not sure about that. Ariel Ahan, who's my colleague with Ensep, uh, thinking about maybe we'll have a side uh, seminar, actually discussion discussing this this question about the role. Of, of gender and leadership uh, in this field. And then there's another one. Where are we actually at now? It may be, I mean, we're going to sit, hear about some amazing science and amazing developments in science over, the, uh, science over this eight weeks. It may be that we ain't seen nothing yet, that we're just at the beginning of it all. So, you know, we're talking about the Internet of Things coming into life, I suppose. What about the Internet of Ecological Things? What about when we're starting to see landscapes like this, which are totally sensed up in that, in that way? Maybe these are experimental designs. We're starting to move this way, you know, in Whiteham Woods. What is this going to mean for our science? And then just to finish off, finish off with this rather nice thing there, which I liked. Um, this is Kevin, uh, a statement from Kevin Kelly, who is um, is one of the founding editors of Wired magazine, and wrote this rather great, rather nice book, and one I liked, called The Inevitable the technological forces which are going to shape the world, shape the future, maybe it was. And in that he says, right now, today, 2016 when it's uh, written, is the best time to start something. This is the moment, now, this decade, when folks in the future will look back at and say, oh to be, have been alive and well then. So maybe the question we're going to ask in this seminar series is, does that apply for science? Yeah. Are you going to get to, to are we going to get to 2035 and everybody's saying you lucky being young starting out in 2018. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah.